right, we are live in Nexus. Welcome to the Nexus Mountain Network podcast live version. It is Thursday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Depending where you are in the world, we are glad you are here because we have a show for you tonight. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Enns is here tonight. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Listen, everybody. You know, I do a lot of shows and they've got a lot of people that climb all these mountains. But I was thinking about Dr. Enns before coming on the show, and I realized you are making a big impact. You are making waves in five of the seven mountains right now. Which two, well, which ones am I missing? The only, and the only reason you might not be making a, a, a big splash is because you ran out of time. Okay. But, uh, that's, uh, I was thinking everyone but business probably, because you're not completely dedicated right now in business, and maybe media, but you'd be so good at it. So, I mean, and everyone's going to find out in this interview how good you are at media. But Dr. Elizabeth Enns, she really is. I mean, you think about education. You think about religion. She's a, currently a senior pastor. You think about family. You think about religion. I already said religion, I think. Government, which we're going to talk about. And so it's long overdue, but I'm so glad you're now on the show. Well, thank you for having me, Chad. I was starting to get a little worried of why I hadn't been on the show yet, but I'm glad to be here. Well, we know that um, it's also a timing issue because you have something really big going on. Um, and I and a lot of people know you as the senior pastor of Antioch International Church, you and your husband, Jesse, and of course, uh, Dr. Peter Wins and Joy uh, as well. And so, but... You are pressing the pedal to the metal in the government mountain as well. And this is really, really cool because how many pastors do you know that say, hey, I'm going to go outside of the four walls of church and I'm going to try to make a difference in the government mountain? I mean, do you really know any any other pastors that have ran? Well, I've actually started to meet a lot in this last season, which is really encouraging. But before this last season, I don't think I knew any. That's because you're a trendsetter. <laughs> so <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, is that um, I, I call her Elizabeth because she's a friend uh, as well and really good friends with my wife, Wendy. But Elizabeth is uh, running for South Carolina State House of Representatives, right? That's correct. Yeah. So this isn't your first time. That is also correct. <laughs> All right. So um, we want to really focus on this a little bit uh, and why take some decisions, why you're doing it, um, and then teach people how to do it for themselves. So let's just start there. Why are you running for South Carolina House of Representatives? Well, first and foremost, because I really felt that the Lord told me to do it. It was not on my grid. It wasn't something I had been thinking about before the initial run two years ago. Uh, the other reason for it is South Carolina is made up of conservative people, but our state, when it comes to how our legislative body votes, we rank the most liberal out of all the Republican states, and we even rank more liberal than some Democratic states. And that. So, so that poses a problem because that means that the people aren't truly being represented in how they want their laws to be and how they want their state to be formed. Wow. So there's so much to unpack here, um, the why and all that kind of stuff. But I'm just curious, is was there a moment in your life that you said, oh, boy, I think I'm getting into politics? It was the right before the 22, uh, 2022 that run. In, in the summer, I was just I was actually meeting with someone else that was running for Congress and they wanted to. I was involved with educating people about our constitution, educating people about bills and things like that. And so they wanted to talk with me because they were going to run. And so in that meeting, as we were talking, I just felt the presence of the Lord come over me and just out of my mouth before I even realized it was a thought, I said, I think I'm going to run for, for office. And so that day I shared it with my husband, Jesse, and he was like, yeah, absolutely. And I was shocked at his response. And then I sat down with my parents and their response was exactly the same. Yes, absolutely. You need to do this. Oh. So that was just the beginning of the end. That was where it all started. Before that moment, I really hadn't had a thought that I should run for politics. When you got serious about that decision, um, did you have like fear? that 
was like, oh, I don't know. And was there like any fear trying to oppose you? I think so. Being in the ministry my whole life, I was very used to people attacking me and coming against me and lying about me. So the things that most people are concerned about in running for politics, that didn't that didn't scare me at all. That didn't concern me. The one thing that I was concerned about is that I didn't know. I didn't know what I didn't know. And so not growing up in this nation, having to learn American politics, having to learn how the government system works in America and policies and all these kinds of things, it was a very steep learning curve on my first round. Um, By the way, I just want to take a quick pause. There's lots of comments coming in right now online. And I just want to let you guys know that are watching. This is interactive. The reason why we do this live is so that we can interact with you. We uh, we want to have your questions. We want to have your comments. And we will uh, look at those comments and look at those questions. And we will insert them into the show. And so thank you for all who are commenting now. There's, There's plenty coming through right now. Um, okay, so you said, here's what's funny. Here's what you said. You said you weren't afraid. You know, I my last show I did was with 11-year-old Jeremiah Oberman. And this young man, he had surgery, had his half of his brain disconnected. If you haven't seen this show, you, you have to do it. It's 15 minutes of just, it's worth it. And so, and I asked him the same question. I said, do you, can you think of a time where you were afraid? And he goes, no. <laughs> And then you just did it too. You're like, no. And I think, I think there's somewhat something to be said about the way you were raised and, you know, your father and your mother who raised you a certain way so that you don't fear. I mean, what role does family play in, in like deciding, Hey, I'm going to have courage. Yeah. A huge role. Exactly what you said. The way I was raised, my parents always had my back. My parents were always, no matter what anyone said to me, they were encouraging me to push past that and that no one else could put limitations on me. And I just needed to fear the Lord. And that's truly how I was raised. And the same thing with my husband and with my three sons, like when it came time to make the decision to run, we sat down as a family because this isn't just my decision and something I wanna do with my life. This truly impacts all of them and I need their support. I need to know that they have my back. And so that was just huge in, in being able to move forward in confidence and move forward knowing that I had an amazing team around me. Yeah. And just so you know, she's not just speaking a game right now. When she talks about her family, I don't know if I've ever met another family that has some of the greatest fruit I have ever seen. And it's apparent, it's obvious. And it's when we, we as a family want to be around her family and her husband and her kids because they rub off. And so what a wonderful candidate to be having running for South Carolina House of Representatives. And so you mentioned that earlier a couple minutes ago you, that you weren't born in this country. Mm-hmm. And so tell us a little bit about the political landscape in Canada versus the United States. Well, even that has changed quite a bit lately. When I grew up, things seemed very peaceful. Everyone was pretty moderate. As I got older, it became the, the political correct thing just kind of took over. So then you you had less freedom of speech, although publicly no one would say, they, they would say you have freedom of speech, but you didn't really feel that. Like Christians, you can be a Christian and worship and everything else, but keep that in your homes, keep that in your uh, private spaces, in your churches. You wouldn't just say, God bless you to someone at the grocery store or pray to someone. That was, I was rare when I did things like that. Okay. So- um, the, so in the politics, things really have changed and it's, it's tricky to even navigate today because now as an outsider looking in, it is very socialist and there's a lot of people that truly have lost their freedoms and many don't yet realize or understand it. And so yesterday I was on a zoom call with the Canadian Polish pastor who, Um, Pastor Arthur, who was imprisoned and what he has gone through because he continued to have church during the shutdowns. And when I started to hear him share his testimony of like being put in solitary confinement for 60 days and just insane things, you would have thought you were back in Germany during the Holocaust. The things that he was expressing that have happened to him over this last season are appalling. And so it's very alarming, the state that Canada is in and their government. 
And it's even more alarming to me that some people aren't even aware of what they're living in. Um, so, but it's a, it's a wake up call to Americans to realize if we don't stand in the gap and build up the wall and stand up for our freedom, stand up for our God given rights in this nation and keep speaking truth, even when people are trying to silence us, if we don't do that while we still can, then we too will lose those rights and opportunities. You know, uh, you said that a lot of people aren't even aware. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. So um, for those that are watching, you know, I did a, a study and I teach on being courageous and having courage. And what I found, if you actually look at the primitive word of courage, it actually means be alert. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not aware, you're just lazy and you're not interested in being courageous. And so the first step to being courageous is being alert. And you certainly are alert. And it's a it's a great lesson for us to see what has happened in Canada and why you're fighting so hard here in the United States to not reinvent what has happened there. And it's, it's too critical of a time. So I'm going to actually go to a question that was just posted uh, in the comments from one of the audience members. This comes from uh, Stephen uh, Paris, and he says to you, in what ways do you plan to represent the Republican voice in South Carolina? Great question, Stephen. Thank you. I think first and foremost to the conservatives, because as a strong conservative, that voice needs to happen at the state house in South Carolina because it's not happening. And so right now, our schools rank among the lowest in the nation. And as a former classroom teacher, that's something that I'm acutely aware of. When I was teaching in the schools, in, in the classrooms, seeing what was happening, it, it was appalling 15 years ago, and it has just gotten worse. So that is something that's near and dear to my heart, and I have school-aged children. But even if I didn't, our education system impacts the future generations. And so if we are not teaching our children to be lifelong learners, if we're not teaching them to be critical thinkers, then history is doomed to repeat itself. And we will just find ourselves in the same place of possible destruction and everything falling apart. So education needs in South Carolina. The other thing that is extremely concerning right now is we do not have any legislation on the books to protect our children from all this gender ideology, from surgeries and um, hormone therapies, what they would call it, the mutilation of children. We have no legislation on the books. We had something come up last year, last session. I went and testified, several others went and testified on how important this is and how children, if they're too young to get a tattoo, if they're too young to drink alcohol, if they're too young to go skydiving, they're definitely too young to make a life-changing decision like cutting off their private parts. And so these types of things we need in South Carolina and we don't have it. They keep kicking that can down the road while so many children's lives are being utterly destroyed. So that's another huge thing that we need to see happen immediately. Also, another big one is parental rights. And that's something that they've talked about, they play around with, but it just keeps getting passed down and passed down. And parents really don't have the rights that they should have and that they think they have. And so we have two cases that are being dealt with on the courts level, one in Columbia, one in Charleston, where schools had shadow files of students that were secretly transitioning without their parents knowing. And so where the, the parental rights are, where parents should always be aware of what's going on, but back to the first one of these things shouldn't even be happening to children anyway. So these are just a couple of like the major issues that I think we need strong conservative voices that are willing to take the heat and willing to speak truth, um, not to pick a fight, but to speak truth, to stand up for our children and for our families. Yeah. And it's so good. And I, I just want to encourage people that it does make a difference. We are seeing change. We are seeing momentum. Like even some of the new laws in North Carolina are doing exactly what you just described it, where you're going in South Carolina. In some ways that South Carolina is ahead and things like that. But along the same lines, I want to ask you a question about uh, the Save Women's um, Sports Bill, because this is along the same lines. And I'm telling you right now, you know, like my oldest daughter, Michaela, and, and my other daughter, Kelsey, both played sports. And as a father... I don't, I honestly don't know how, what I would do. I'm not in that position, but I don't know what I would do. So this is an initiative that you're also getting involved in as well. Is that correct? That's correct. So a couple of years ago, 
there was a bill that came forward in in response to what happened with the swim team. And, and that's kind of the whole Leah Thomas situation. And so we realized in South Carolina, we did not have any protections for our women sports teams in a college level and a high school level. And so again, I, I started rallying the troops. I started getting people to call their representatives, call their senators. I started doing Facebook videos on, here's the facts, here are the differences. It, it's not just to do with whether you sit or stand when you pee. Like there's so many differences, even down to the rods and cones in your eyeballs are different between a female and a male. There's so many differences in our bodies. And so when it comes to sports, it becomes very unfair for a biological male to be who cannot be other biological males to then be able to join in and rob women from scholarships and from things that they have worked their whole lives for. And on that note, it was interesting because there was um, a, a swimming group put together a transgender so that there was like the male competition, the female competition and a transgender competition. And this just hit the news, I think yesterday, where they had to cancel it because no transgender uh, swimmers signed up. And that's very oh, telling. That yes is extremely is. telling. It is not just so that you can compete. It yeah. is so that you can rob women. And the bigger picture is is actually robbing women from their place in society. And there was something else that hit the news today of a, a tech conference of some sort, and it was for women. And there are, there are avenues in our society which women have had this ceiling over. And, and so there's areas that it's like, okay, this, this is a women's competition. This is just for women. And, and in this season right now, there is this group that is trying to destroy women from excelling and, and it's, it's terrible really. And so when it comes to sports here in South Carolina, this bill was brought forward for women in college and women in high school to be only competing against biological females. And it was crazy, the amount of um, people coming against us from, from colleges and the NCAA and just all these different groups. And it was like, this is crazy. This is craziness. And it all comes down to money and power. And so we just kept fighting. We kept fighting and we kept fighting. And we really had to rally women from all over the state to come together. We showed up at the state house so many times with um, rallies, with signs, with just we continued and we can, until we could get, get the ball over the goal line and get that bill passed. So we actually passed it in South Carolina, which was a huge win. But what we are seeing on so many other fronts across the nation and across the world, this continued fight for women having safe spaces like our dressing rooms, like even prisons, or shelters for battered women. Like, it's crazy to think of a woman who has, who has, is in hiding, running away from an abusive boyfriend or husband, and then she has to sleep next to a man who's just claiming to identify as a female and, and how that puts her in a very awkward and fearful situation. And same with in the prisons. So there, this is already happening in some prisons where it's a woman's prison, but a male who has identified as a woman who was convicted, convicted of rape and pedophilia because he said he was identifying as a female got to go to the women's prison. I, I mean, it's just beyond all common sense. And so putting those women in jeopardy of being attacked and by this already convicted male. So this is something on a local level, but also even a federal level that there is an uprising of women saying, we will not be silent. We will not be written out of history. We will do this for ourselves, for our daughters and our granddaughters. So that's good. Thank you for, for like going for it. And uh, you got a lot of comments on that response. And Stephen even said, uh, yes, that's exactly what we wanted to hear. That's great answer. Uh, ends 2024. <laughs> it's going across the screen. Uh, some guy named Jesse Ends is saying, hit him with the truth. I don't know who that is. Uh, but uh, so I do want to go to the audience again. I want to ask another uh, question that comes from Tiffany Van Essen. And she says, what are the ways that she can join your team to help you get elected? 
Well, Tiffany, you can go to elizabethends.com and sign up on our page to be part of helping our campaign. There's lots of ways that people can help with um, phone calls and helping knock on doors and deliver things, helping us with rallies and all of that as time unfolds. And then also to donate. Campaigns cost money. And there's a lot that we realize we are preparing for a big fight here in District 26. And so we have a lot of preparations to do with that. And all of it comes down to being able to uh, to purchase what we need to purchase and get mailers out and all of that. Awesome. All right. So, um, again, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the comment section. We are watching that. So I want to unravel something because let's take people behind the scenes with you because, uh, you know, polit politicians, um, they're great communicate in general, they're great communicators and they generally can stand up and resist and be strength and put on something. But behind the scenes, a lot is going on. There's a lot going on against families. Uh, there's a lot going on potentially emotionally. And there's something that's called a political offense. Uh, that's a term I just made up. But the <laughs> fact that you have so many opportunities to be offended, and especially in politics. So First of all, tell us, take us behind the scenes when you ran last time. And by the way, I'm going to give you a chance to think about an example and how you're going to answer this question. But if you don't know, so Dr. Elizabeth Enns ran for the first time and she ran in South Carolina and she went for it because God told her to do it. She, she came out of nowhere, competed against an incumbent and did so well, it was pushed to a runoff election and she narrowly missed it. Now she's in a different district and she's running again. And we feel confident that the Lord has called her to do this again. Now, let's go behind the scenes. So what happened during your first election that surprised you? Um, I'm not sure necessarily that I was surprised, but I definitely learned some things. And I, I fully expected things to, to get ugly. I fully expected people to be backstabbing and, and all of that. But there were some things that I recognize that I could have done better and to prepare for the future. And one of those things was in the pastor role, when people attack you and talk badly about you, you just forgive them, release it. You know, that's your issue, not mine. God bless you. And you move on. But and so in the political world, I just paid very little attention to the lies that were being spoken about me and the, the things that were happening negatively towards me. I just ignored it and focused on the good that I want to do and why I'm running. So what I learned is that people don't look for the truth. They hear that gossip. They hear that lie. And very few people look for the truth. They just believe what they've heard. And so then that lie sticks with them. So what I learned is that I actually have to address those lies. I have to, to come out publicly and, and say, you might've heard this or these kinds of things are being said, and this is what the truth is. And then not that I want to spend a lot of time there, then I can pivot into why I'm a better candidate and why I will serve the, um, the state well, but it's important to be able to debunk the lies and speak to them directly and then bring truth to the situation. See, this is a great example of what I, I love is something called situational leadership. And so what you learned in that moment, it was that you led by the situation because you've been a pastor for how long, have you, how long have you been a pastor? Since 2006. Okay. So what yeah. is it? You can't do the math. So I think it's like 17 years. Yeah. Is that right? okay. yeah. This October, actually, this October, it'll be 17 years. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Good, 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 good for me. All right. So um, situational leadership is really important because the way you would handle maybe gossip in the church or, or maybe if someone is speaking against you, you're like, I got it. Or in this, in this case, it's like, no, you got to speak up. You have to say something. And I do think, in the, especially in the government realm, that that is why you're there. You are put in place not to be silent. You're put in place to cause change for what God wants you to do and his purposes. And so it kind of leads me to uh, one of the questions that I have from one of our audience members, uh, Renee Mills. And so she asked the question, and I'm going to just tweak it a little bit. Um, Regardless of any of the mountain types or you're currently running for office or the religion mountain, just in general, talking to Elizabeth here, I'm not talking about the candidate, I'm not talking to the pastor, 
is what is your greatest passion? Serving the Lord. Mm-hmm. My life is so all laid down for the Lord. And if if I felt strongly that he's, if he spoke to me and said, now I want you to pivot and go do this. I decided a long, a long time ago that I just laid my life down for him. So that is number one, hundred percent what I'm most passionate about. I love that. And let me expand upon that for, for what I saw with Elizabeth and her husband, Jesse. So I was very fortunate um, that I was actually in the room and it was the night that um, they found out they, that she didn't win. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting there and I had like, kind of like a little bit of tears in my eyes because not because they lost actually the, the emotional tears I had in my eyes was because of how proud I was of you guys and how proud you worked. And, and I watched you and I, my, the tears got a little bit bigger <laughs> and you stood there and said, I did what I was supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And this is so important for anyone that's watching. You just have to do what God's called you to do and don't put an expectation on the outcome. The key to your success is obedience. Mm-hmm. Like even what we do with Nexus, that numbers doesn't define success. Obedience defines success. If God tells me to do it, I'll do that. Whatever that is. And this is a great example of Elizabeth going out and saying, God told me to do this, and I'm just going to do that. And then it showed at the end when she got the results that she actually didn't win. And I watched that and she went so high in my book. I was like, boop, 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 boop. she was already high in my book and she went even higher. And so this is, that's a great example. So I'm glad you're passionate about serving the Lord because the decisions you make reflect that. Okay. So um, you played a big role also in a very important bill in South Carolina that really needs to be replicated across all the states in the United States. And that is the heartbeat bill. Tell us about your role and what it is. So it started with, I'm very passionate about uh, pro-life issues, all pro-life issues from the womb to the tomb. And this is something that I started when I was a young teenager. It's been a big part of my life. And so in 2020, a heartbeat bill came forward. And by 2021, it was uh, moving forward in our legislation here in South Carolina. And so I was asked to go and testify at the state house in favor of the heartbeat bill. And so I did. And something that I always do when I go and testify, it's it's easy to just bring the same thing that everybody else is bringing from one side or the other and just want, 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 say the same thing. And it's like, who can yell a little louder? But what I do is I actually ask the Lord, Lord, what would you have me bring? Because there's lots of things we can bring to the table, lots of reasons why we need to be pro-life, why we need to protect the, the baby in the womb. And so I, I put together this three-minute speech. You have three minutes and then that's it. You're shut up. And so first of all, once I got to the state house, I was surprised at Um, what I was up against, because it wasn't just Planned Parenthood, but it was also um, very pro-life people that, that it's all or nothing. They, it's all or nothing, absolutely no abortions for any reason. And, and they're not what's called incrementalists. And so I had never even heard of that. I didn't even know that that was a thing. And so I found myself like, okay, how do I let them know I totally agree with them. Abortions should never, never be legal, but we we have to, we have to change the courtroom of public opinion to get there. And so I just, I just prayed and uh, um, was like, cause I was so caught off guard. So anyway, I testified and what I spoke to specifically was if we have to say there has to be room for rape and incest and even though I personally don't agree that that's a reason for abortion at all. But so I, in my testimony said, if we have to say that, then there needs to be a report made to the police because a crime has been committed. And so if you just have an abortion, you're literally flushing the evidence down the toilet and that's not okay. So there has to be a police report and somehow taken into account the evidence so that we can prosecute or else we just continue having uh, rapists and 
like all these injustices happen and nobody's held accountable. Yeah. So, so they ended up putting that into the bill. And that was a really big deal because that was something that was stopping that bill from moving forward. So that bill passed in the House, passed in the Senate, got signed by the governor. It was, it was very exciting. And then right away, immediately, it was challenged in court and we lost it in court. The Supreme Court said, you know, they made their ruling and they kicked it out. There was like an and where there should have been a comma and all these kind of logistical things. So we fixed the heartbeat bill and made it stronger and even more strict actually. And the Supreme Court of South Carolina voted it passed through the house again and the Senate and the governor signed it and the Supreme Court held it up this summer, which was a huge win. And because we saw in the one year after the Supreme Court shut it down, our we became an abortion destination state and it was disgusting. Our abortions went through the roof. The numbers were so high. And, and it was just, I know it was grieving the heart of God and it was grieving all of, all of us who watch closely. Some people I don't think had any idea, even if they are pro-life, they didn't realize how absolutely terrifying, like how terrible it was, how I think in January there were a thousand, like the numbers were just over the top. So we were able to pass that. And and there are lots of states that have similar laws at this point, and they're fighting for more. And we can definitely learn from one another the things that work, the things that don't work. And we need to now look at making it more strict. But what as pro-life people we need to do is actually change the public opinion and bring in proper education so that people start to understand when life begins. If students in school are being taught that it's not a baby until it comes out of the womb and breathes air for the first time, then that's seriously wrong. Like right from fertilization. And that's when life begins. If that little phrase gets added into every kind of lesson, then that shifts the thought process of, well, if that's a life, why would I kill it? If that's a, if that's a life, then then abortion is murder. And so, but we have to just start to change because we've had 50 plus years of false education. We now need to shift and change a generation by teaching true science, true biology, and educating the populace to realize when life begins, the side effects of abortions on the, on the woman, um, just all of the things that are in place that have been hidden. Yeah. I mean, isn't it like, uh, is it 1% of abortions are due to rape and incest? Is, is that the statistic, the latest it one? It might even be less than that. Now, some people might argue that others are just not being reported. Um, yeah. But even if it's true, when in our society do we hold the death penalty over a child for the crime of their father? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, you, uh, when you, this upcoming election for you, the primary is really important. So why would you be the best Republican chosen over another Republican that you might agree with? Well, I'd have to meet that Republican that I agree with, for okay. starters. Okay. Uh, <laughs> currently, um, there is someone, there is an incumbent in this seat who has told many people through throughout our district that she is not running again. Um, and no one else has come forward. But if there was another Republican that we we held the same values, I would still say that I believe that I'm the one for the job. And part of that has to do with how strong of a backbone I have. And but also, and this is going to sound terrible, but that I walk in humility and understand that I don't know everything. And so I need to surround myself with wise counsel because there is much to be learned from the people around us. And so when we do that, when we both are we're, we're strong, we have a strong moral compass, we understand what's right and what's wrong. We understand the constitution. That's very important. Understanding what our constitutional, our God-given rights are that are supposed to be um, protected by the constitution. These things are important. And what I've learned in this last couple of years is there's a lot of legislators that win a popularity contest 
who haven't got a clue about policy. They haven't got a clue about legislation. They haven't got a clue about how this bill affects all these other things because of that little phrase. And, and so I don't, know all the things either, but I understand how this works and I understand the importance of seeking wise counsel so that we don't fall prey to bad laws that end up hurting us and taking our rights away. So I'll choose my words carefully in this next question because there's kids watching. Um, I almost said, how are you different than a rhino? (laughs) (laughs) And I'm thinking some kids going, you better not be calling my mom a rhino. Maybe your your boys are watching. So well, but my boys obvious, know what Mr. that means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your boys probably your boys know what it means. So for those that don't, I'm talking about a Republican in name only. So uh, and that is a real deal. I mean, we're seeing a mess right now in Congress. You've seen it before. You've run against someone before that would be probably considered that. So how are you different than someone who is a who can considered a rhino? Well, part of it is even knowing the Republican platform. Like if you look at the the basics of these are the pillars of the Republican platform, they're solid. And so when we hold our legislate our legislators accountable of you say that you're a Republican and the Republican platform says they're pro-life, then your bills and whatever you vote on should be pro-life. If you say you're a Republican and we believe in lower taxes, then you should not be voting to raise our taxes. And there's certain things like this that education and transparency have to be part of this whole thing. Because currently in South Carolina, there are a lot of legislators that don't vote in accordance to the Republican platform, but they have an R beside their name. And For a long time, there was no transparency in South Carolina. It's only been in recent years that they started filming uh, what happens and and how they vote. It's only been in in recent sessions where they actually could call a roll call vote. So instead of everybody just saying eyes and nays to vote on things, which is ridiculous, they actually have to push the button and it's documented how they voted. And so this has shifted something and people in South Carolina have started to watch and be awake to this. And so it's actually a great time to join the conservative bandwagon in South Carolina because the conservative people are watching and they are looking for legislators to represent them well. Ladies and gentlemen, you can see why she makes a great representative for not only South Carolina, but she represents so much in this nation. And I'm so proud of you. I'm proud of your family. My wife, Wendy's proud of you. Um, Keep up the great work. God is with you. We stand with you, behind you, for you. Lift your arms up. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Chad.